Prepare to be absolutely fascinated by the world of bees as we journey into the story of Rupert Phillips, a Swan Valley apiarist and founder of the House of Honey and the Sticky Spoon Cafe. You'll be transfixed by Rupert's sheer knowledge and passion for beekeeping that traces back to the age of eight in South Africa. He clearly explains the lifespan structure of a bee colony, how they're individually and yet collectively connected and how they work together. He also goes into the honey making process as well as the wealth of other health products that come from bees. Rupert also talks about his journey to turning his passion into a business. He also goes into the current challenges facing the bee populations globally as well as the health of the WA honey industry. You'll be blown away by the enthusiasm and clarity of this wonderful man and you'll be left reflecting on how much you can learn and apply from these incredible little creatures. And if you want more of Rupert, you can actually go and catch him this weekend as he's the ambassador of the Entwined in the Valley Food, Drink and Arts Festival. He's doing a masterclass where he expands even further on some of the great knowledge that he shares in this podcast. But for now, enjoy Rupert. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. Today, we're going to dive into the life of a beekeeper with my guest, Rupert Phillips. Born in Kenya, Rupert moved with his family at a young age to South Africa. Rupert's interest in bees started at the age of eight, when he'd been keeping an eye on a colony of bees in the tree of his family farm. He was then encouraged to follow his interest in bees by his father, who took him to see an old beekeeper nearby, who began teaching Rupert the intricacies of beekeeping, and so the journey began. He moved to Australia in 1982, originally to Tasmania, and then to WA in 1984. But it wasn't until 2005 that beekeeping became a lifestyle as well as a passion. Rupert had a lifetime dream of developing a dedicated honey shop and a cafe for people to taste and learn about bees, a shop where people could experience and understand the amazing bee. In 2010, that dream became a reality when the House of Honey and the Sticky Spoon Cafe opened. Rupert is also one of the ambassadors of the Entwined in the Valley Food, Wine, Music and Art Festival later this week in the Swan Valley, where he'll be sharing much of his beekeeping wisdom. Rupert, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Thank you. One of the things I like to ask is, is what was places that people grew up in. What was it like growing up in South Africa? Because it must have been an interesting time. It was fabulous, yeah. We, uh, where we lived was up in a mist belt, which is about 3,000 feet above sea level. Um, and there were a lot of trees growing in that area because uh, the forestry department used to grow... Um, amongst other things, wattle trees, um, but also a type of eucalyptus called a saligna gum, which I understand is something similar to a Sydney blue gum. Um, the reason why they grew them there was because they used to use the timber to keep the roofs up in the gold mines. Right. So they were mine props. <clears throat> Excuse me. So these trees grew very well where we lived. And um, of course, being a, uh, a eucalyptus tree, they used to flower profusely every year. And that usually occurred in about April to June. And uh, during that time, um, these plantations were fairly close to where we lived. And we had 26 acres. So it was a lovely piece of bush, uh, quite a lot of uh, natural bush around, uh, big old trees with hollows in. And of course, there were bees in those hollows. And uh, when these trees flowered, the smell of honey was just incredible coming, drifting down through the woods, especially in the sort of cooler autumn evenings you could really get a good whiff of this honey and I thought to myself that stuff smells magical <laughs> I really need to get to those bees and see how I can get some of that honey so that's how it all began and um, it was a very magical life because um, I can recall being at school a lot of kids would want to go and play sport and everything all I wanted to do was to go home and walk around in the woods and look for bees and and uh, and climb trees it was a fantastic fantastic upbringing definitely awesome and um if we go back to that time when you you know you wanted to go and find out about the honey and the bees what what was it that um fascinated you about the bees um i guess their social order you know i mean they all looked so organized all the time because um a lot of beekeepers will tell you this a lot of fascination is gained from just sitting and watching a beehive. Now, uh, some people think, gosh, that's boring, you know, but if you sit there and you watch all these bees coming to and fro, 
with their little loads of pollen. Some don't have any pollen on their back legs, they just seem to fly straight in. Uh, albeit haphazardly, that's because they're probably full of nectar. So they're nectar gathering bees and they're pollen gathering bees. So you can sit there and watch how they come in and um, each beehive has uh, guards at the front door. So right. they check the identity of the people entering. Right. Um, so uh, you can see them, if a, bee, if a bee approaches the entrance of the hive and sort of flies in a bit of a haphazard way, those guard bees will stand up on their back legs and sort of follow it and look at it uh, as if it's going to try and dart in there and steal some of their honey. So they're pretty good at defending their hives. So right. I used to find all that fascinating, just sitting there and watching them. It's actually quite mesmerizing. Mm. I think that is one of the most fascinating things about beekeeping. Right. And then I'm going to ask you a bit more about bees in a minute. But um, it's kind of a, as I said in the introduction, it's kind of a great step that your father noticed that you were that interested and then took you to go and meet a beekeeper. Hmm. Um, was that the sort of thing your father did or was it just... I think um, for all his faults, that was certainly <laughs> one of his strong hmm. points. Um, he loved where we lived as well. He was a civil engineer and... Uh, he used to work in town, but um, I think he used to really enjoy coming home to the bush as well. So to see me interested in something that perhaps might have actually intrigued him as well was probably a good thing because I think that was a catalyst for him deciding, oh, well, maybe you need to go and see that old fellow up the road. Mm. And incidentally, the poor fellow up the road didn't even have a nose. Right. He was a World War I survivor and something had happened to his nose in combat and he just had two little holes in his face, bless him. Right. He was quite scary looking. This is Vernon. This is Vernon Lake, yeah. yes. And um, he was elderly then, so um, I mean he must have long passed on, but he was such a kind, gentle soul and he, you could see he really loved his bees. So um, I don't know how my dad got to know that he actually lived up the road or who he was but uh, obviously he'd made some inquiries so yes I guess my, my dad did actively go out and try and find out a bit more about it. Mm. I just find it interesting because um, one of the things that has been turning up in my past podcast is where people actively engage with a teacher and somebody who has the knowledge and then they are in that um, student space Obviously, as an eight-year-old, it's quite easy to be in there. But as an adult, often we, we think we know better and, and yes. so on. So to have that uh, informative experience at such a young age must have been a real privilege. It was a real privilege. Um, uh, I must say I didn't spend a lot of time with him. I only probably visited his place five times um, in the time that I was learning how to keep bees. Mm. I don't know whether that was because of my schooling and, you know, I, I was only available to pop up there at the weekends mm. and he wasn't available, I'm not sure. But um, he didn't live too far away. Um, but I could, I, I felt that he was actually happy to divulge everything he knew about bees. And, and he had such a basic approach to beekeeping. I mean, he had no fancy equipment to mm. help him along. He just plotted along doing his little thing but at all times it it really it really showed that he really cared for his bees so um he was the ideal person to to get in touch with i and think see that role um, model yeah start. I, I think i think a lot of the the other learning i gained was actually from reading a lot i did read a lot of uh, a lot of books they had a beekeeping in south african book in south africa book out at that time and there was quite a lot of uh, literature available from the states right so <clears throat> Fortunately for me, there was a bee shop uh, in the town where we lived and uh, they used to make bee equipment and sell it all over the country, but they actually had some of that paraphernalia there so I could I could avail myself of some of the literature, so it was quite mm. good. And this is all still at that very early age? Yes, yeah. Superb. So it was, it was uh, kind of a combination of all sorts of things. And uh, I think when you're genuinely keen on something and really have a thirst for knowledge and a thirst to know how things work, then I think you can achieve anything, really. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you can just follow that enthusiasm. That's right. It's almost like a compass pointing north yes. to where you need yeah. to go. Yeah, So I I, uh, I really enjoyed going to see him, as I say, not that often, but um, when I was there, I I, I really enjoyed myself. His, his dear wife used to make us uh, tea and scones, and used to mm. sit there and have a tea and scone and look over the beehives. 
Mm. And a lot of the hives that he had were just old tomato boxes. He just knocked them up himself. He didn't have the money, perhaps, to buy all the new equipment. So he just used to make his own beehives out of tomato boxes and old paraffin boxes. Mm. So fascinating. Do you still keep some of that philosophy now? <laughs> Um, do I still keep yeah. it? Yes. Well, beekeepers are generally a resourceful lot. And, um, <laughs> and if we can stick a rubber band on something, just like uh, the good old Aussie out in the bush, just to keep it going, we'll do that. And uh, I think you have to be yeah. because you're on your own. You're on your own a lot and you've got to rely on yourself. Yeah. You can't rely on anybody else because you break down. Nobody's going to want to come next to a truck of bees no. to help you out. So no. we do have to be resourceful. And I think, yes, I did learn from him uh, from that point of view. That resourcefulness. Mm. Definitely. So um, you alluded to it a minute ago. Can you start to give me a bit of an insight into uh, the structure, the lifespan, the colony uh, of a bee? Sure, I can. Uh, there is a bit of a difference between the bees in Australia and the bees in Africa. The bees okay. in Africa are considerably more um, aggressive, right? More of a defensive bee. Even though they come from originally the same species, they have uh, different subspecies. And mm -hmm. the one in in um, in South Africa was called initially Apis mellifera adesoni, but they renamed that to Apis mellifera scutellata, which is just a genus of this bee, mm. um, which obviously originated in um, in Northern Africa or, or over in Europe somewhere. Um, <clears throat> those bees were very defensive. So the way we kept bees in South Africa was a lot different to the way we keep bees here. Okay. Um, they are much more workable here because they're right. not quite so bad tempered. Having said that, I we still have some bad tempered hives here, but. Um, the structure of the hive... what a bad-tempered hive looks like in a minute. Yes. After <laughs> this. That's right. <laughs> but um, they... Um, yeah, there are some hives that are more bad-tempered than others. And it all depends on the queen and mm. who the queen is mated with. But I can go into that later. But um, basically, um, you have a queen, which, will, uh, which is the head of the colony. And uh, all she is, is a developed worker bee. Because any worker bee can actually be a queen bee. Right. It's just that it's not fed royal jelly for the rest of its life, for the for the remainder of its life. So when a when a bee is uh, when a, a a queen bee lays an egg, a fertilized egg, it'll become a worker bee. But if the bees feed that that grub with royal jelly for the duration of the time that it is a larva, it'll become a queen bee. Right. So I guess you could say a worker bee is an underdeveloped queen bee. Because right. what happens is all the larvae are fed royal jelly for the first three days of their lives, irrespective of what they're going to turn out to be. <coughs> Excuse me. And then after that, they're fed uh, um, honey and pollen by the by the worker bees, so they end up being just a worker bee. Right. What it does is it. And how does it, it, it how's, doesn't? How's it, that chosen? It, well, the bees the bees themselves can choose whether they want to raise a queen. In in a case of emergency when a queen has been killed or something, they can they can easily just feed some of these larvae with raw jelly and and breed yes. a few queens. Sometimes yes. ten or twelve, sometimes up to twenty. Right. And then uh, one of them will hatch, and then the survival of the fittest rule comes in, and she'll knock yes. off all the rest, and then she'll become the head of the colony. Right. But um, the other reason why they will produce a queen bee is if they are going to swarm in the springtime and what that means is the colony's got too big for the hollow or the hive that they're in and they'll divide and what happens is the old queen will dash out of the hive she'll stop laying eggs so she'll get lighter and she'll dash off out of the hive with half the half the bees yep. and then back in the old hive um, there will be queen cells in there which the worker bees know that they have to raise these queens because the queen's going to disappear mm. and then they'll all fight and then one of them will survive and then take over as the head of the colony so with the queen bees there's quite a lot of it's quite a lot of intricacies involved with queens and queen rearing and so on we actually artificially make queen bees and i say artificially because we stimulate the bees into feeding these larvae right. with royal jelly so that they can develop and the royal jelly bees. is it actually comes from the glands of a worker bee mm. the head glands of a worker bee um, hyperpharyngeal gland is the name of the gland and um, only worker bees that are under three weeks old can produce this this stuff right. this royal jelly so it's a very special mix that actually as i say determines whether a bee is going to be a queen or whether mm. it's just going to be a worker bee so <clears throat> there's there's a bit here i'm still not quite getting is that um so 
We're talking about a lot of females here, is that right? Yes, they're all females, yes. So yes. Um, what our, it's probably easiest to describe um, what actually happens initially. When a queen bee is born, it's a virgin queen. After three or four days, she'll go off, she'll fly off into the field, generally in a cleared area in a forest or over a ploughed field or somewhere, because she knows drone bees are going to be there. Now, drone bees are the male bees. Right. right? They're the boys of the hive. And the queen can lay drone bees by just laying an unfertilized egg. Right. So what happens is the queen will fly out and she'll have a few mating flights with drones over a few days. And then she'll come back to the hive. This is the first she couple stores, of days of life. Yeah. yeah. And she'll store that sperm in her body and then she'll start laying eggs. Now, the unique thing about these queen bees is they can actually determine the sex of the egg that they're laying. So they can either fertilize it on the way out or they can just lay an unfertilized egg. If they lay an unfertilized egg, it'll just be a drone. If right. they lay a fertilized egg, it'll be a worker. But that worker could even be a queen if it's fed the right, right. stuff. So, so that's how it all works. So the queen can actually lay eggs up to 2,000 a day for up to 60 years. Wow. So she lives a lot longer than any of the other bees. So the worker bees will only last six months in, in summer. or right. um, Sorry, six weeks in summer or six months in winter. It all depends on whether they work themselves to death, basically. Mm. And the drone bees, well, um, every colony of bees has drone bees. Um, yes. They're bigger than the normal worker bee. Um, they don't have stings, and uh, as I said to you before, they're unfertilized eggs. So um, their sole purpose is to mate with a queen bee, but right. not the queen in the hive. They will only mate yeah. with other queens to ensure genetic variation of the species. Right. So every and they day, know that. yeah. So every day, eleven, eleven till two, generally when it's a bit warmer, because you know. Us males are a bit lazy. We'd only like to go out when it's warmer. And uh, they take off. You can actually see them all leaving the hive in droves. <clears throat> They're very strong flyers. They have much bigger wings than a worker bee. And um, they, uh, they, they fly off and they go over these ploughed fields and, and uh, all sorts of places and, um, and uh, look for queen bees who are going to fly through their yes. little congregation. They actually call it a congregation area, a right. drone congregation area. Fascinating thing is if you if you can identify where these drones are flying, if you throw a rock through the air, they'll chase it, thinking it's a queen bee. Right. Also, I must say on. they should have gone to Specsavers, but <laughs> yeah, they're on. They're on. <laughs> they're ready for it. So these queens know where to fly and they know where to go and mate with the drones. And and uh, to take it a step further, apparently they can even tell when it's a drone from their own hive and push them off. Right. I guess it's got to do with smell, um, but they know that they shouldn't be mating with one of their own offspring. Their own, yes. Yeah. Otherwise, you might end up with a few freak bees out there. Yes. So, um, when a queen does do that, by chance, if it does happen, then generally she doesn't lay eggs for very long and she's what they call superseded fairly quickly. So, yes. the worker bees will realize that she's not 100% in her genetic variation yeah. and then they'll raise another queen and... Mm -hmm that queen will knock her off wow so yeah so you have those three types of bees the drones the males and no sting the workers they live for between six weeks and six months depending on how hard they're working and then the queen which can live up to six years from a commercial point of view or from a beekeeping point of view we usually only keep a queen for about two years because after that her egg laying capacity starts to diminish quite right. significantly and um, from a commercial point of view when you're actually producing honey you actually have to have as many bees in the hive as possible Yes. So you can always tell when there's a, an older queen in the hive because there won't be as many bees. And the drone, I'm uh, sorry, the brood pattern in the, in the brood nest, which is where they lay all the eggs, will not be as prolific as it would be with a younger queen. So right. generally we always try and have younger queens in the hives so that we have as many bees as possible because more, more bees equals more honey gathering capabilities. Yes. Yeah. Superb. I'm amazed by the, the the orderliness of it all, and and the the ruthless efficiency as well. Yes, yeah. Well, to maintain order in the hive, the queen actually um, emits these pheromones, which actually come from her feet, mm. little glands in her feet. And the strange thing is, is that um, bees can act individually on individual instincts, but they can also act collectively. Mm. So they seem to have a collective thought process. I mean. 
you think about, which is what happened last weekend, we had the first warmish day that we've had for a while, and I was driving through the bush up uh, north of us here, and I uh, went through clouds and clouds and clouds of flying ants. Now, how do flying ants know that this is the day and this is the hour that we all need to pile out and go and, go and have a bit of a, a, a party out there in the sky? I mean, it's just incredible that termite nests from you know, tens of kilometers away all do the same thing all on the same day. What is yeah. it? Same thing with bees. They know when something's not quite right in the hive. So when that queen is starting to get old and she's perhaps not laying as many eggs as she could do, the bees sense these pheromones are not quite as strong as they used to be. Yeah. We're not got too many young in here. Let's have a bit of an uprising here. That's Let's feed a couple of the through. workers with some royal jelly and we'll get a new queen in. Wow. So that new queen will actually knock off the old queen because they have a fight. And obviously the older one who's walking around on a couple of canes and maybe a wheelchair can't fight as well as the new vigorous one. Mm. And, uh, and that's it. That's what happens. Mm. And then that new queen will go out and mate. And as long as she's successful in mating, um, she'll come back and, and start laying eggs and off it goes again. So a new cycle begins. Fascinating. It is. It is amazing. So now I understand more about the the bees and their lifespan and their structure. Can you tell me a bit more about the honey making process? Okay, um, are you talking about um, how a bee actually gathers yes. honey? All right, there are a lot of, as you would know, there are a lot of flowers out there. The, in Australia, we're particularly uh, fortunate because of the eucalyptus species and there are very, very many eucalyptus species uh, in WA and in fact in the whole of Australia. So um, I think when they first brought bees to this country in the 1800s, they realised just how fortunate we, we are because bees produce an amazing amount of honey from... Were they not here bees. previously? They, there were uh, native bees here before, but mm. there weren't the European honeybee. So they were brought in to pollinate um, you know, recently cultivated lands and veggie patches and whatever else, and then right. they've just basically spread all around Australia. So the native bees, they, they are present, but they live in much smaller colonies. They don't produce as much honey. They're not as prolific hoarders as the uh, Italian bees or the European honeybee is. So um, basically that's benefited us here. So a bee has got an extraordinary smell. It can smell anything. You can drive through a wide open field and if I have a box of honey on the back of the ute, you can be guaranteed there'll be a cloud of bees around there sniffing to see what it is. Mm. They come out of nowhere. They're just amazing at being able to pick up scents. So... When a tree's flowering, they'll find it. I mean, we can put bees out in the middle of the heathland up there on the coast and it looks like there's not a flower in sight, but the bees will find the flowers and they'll bring the honey in. So they're right. really amazing little creatures in terms of being able to locate nectar sources. So honey is actually called nectar when it's in a, in a, uh, a uh, in the plant itself. Okay, So the nectaries of the plant will secrete nectar usually at night and this bounty of nectar is waiting for the bees early in the morning. So in the summer, you see bees actually flying sometimes even before sunup to try and get first dibs on what's out there. Mm. So <clears throat> the bee will visit the flower. It's got a tongue. It's a little proboscis, sticks it down, sucks up the honey and puts it in a honey sack in its, in its body. And generally, there are bees that will collect nectar and there are bees that will collect pollen. And there's some of them will collect both. But generally, it's a bit of a defined yep. scenario um, so the bee will collect the nectar it'll fill up um, and in the case of a tree such as uh, or, or plant species such as um, red gum um, the plant the actual flower bowls you could call them are so big that they you know it would probably take a bee four or five visits to actually suck all that nectar up to actually take it back to the hive so right. they're prolific producers of nectar so the bee just fills up as much as it can in its honey sack and then it'll fly back to the hive but something happens to that those sugars in the honey in the nectar should i say mm. whilst it's in the stomach of the bee the bee adds a an enzyme called invertase which actually inverts sugars it changes the sugars into glucose and fructose right so when the bee then regurgitates the honey into the cell of the hive, it has actually undergone a chemical change. Right. It may still be as watery, but it definitely has had the sugars inverted. Um, what then happens is um, some of the bees can put the honey directly into the cells. Other times you'll find a 
returning forager bee actually transferring the honey to another bee who will then store it. Oh, so they so they yeah, so they basically just stand next to or face each other and then transfer the honey through their little tongues. Right. Which is fascinating to watch. Yes. You can see it quite often. Um, once the honey is, or once the, and I could call it honey now because it has undergone that change, right. is deposited in the cell, um, the bees will uh, generally during the evening create a, an airflow through the hive. So if, you'll have, if you look at the entrance of a hive, you'll see some bees facing inwards, some bees facing outwards, all fanning their wings. Right. <clears throat> so what they're doing is they're creating an air circulation through the hive. And the reason for that is they evaporate the water from the nectar that's recently been brought in during that day um, to try and reduce it to about 17% water by volume. Hence the sticky nature of honey. Right. So they can't, they can't just store it the way it is because it'll ferment because it's got a very high water content. So they know that they need to get that water content out and that's how they achieve it. Yes. So <clears throat> as a beekeeper, I think one of the magical things apart from sitting there watching a hive uh, with the bees coming to and fro, I feel is when you're walking through an apiary in the evening when they're on, you know, a good honey flow, and they call it a honey flow, um, the smell and the sound is just incredible. There's a low bzzz. You can hear these bees uh, fanning this air, and the smell is just incredible. It'll knock you over sometimes, depending on the species. that was the smell that you yes, first witnessed that's what I Yes, that's what I could smell when yes. I was a, a kid. So... Um, when that honey is down to about 70% water by volume, obviously it's harder for more difficult for the bees in tropical climates because of the ambient um, water content in yep. the air. Um, so hence you'd actually find quite a few tropical honeys are actually quite runny, dark and runny, because right. bees just can't evaporate that water from it. Yeah. Um, and it tastes a little bit more on the fermented side than uh, you know honey gathered in perhaps semi-arid conditions where it's quite dry. You find a very low water content. Some of those are fourteen percent. Yes, make it a very very sticky honey. So um, the bees fill up the cells, and then when they're um, when they're near the top, and the honey is of sufficient uh, water content, they'll actually cap it over. They'll put a cap over the top, and the cap is made of wax, which is what the comb is made of, which the bees actually manufacture themselves. Yeah. To manufacture wax, bees just uh, eat a lot of honey, hang in chains. Would you believe um, onto honey each other's too. legs? quite closely, quite um, tightly, and they generate a lot of heat and the wax actually just comes out in little platelets from the abdomen. Wow. And they will grab these little platelets and mold them into the fantastic shapes that we know um, it constitutes a, a honeycomb, which is the hexagonal with the apex pointing upwards. They never have yeah. the flat side at the top, they always have the apex pointing upwards. Right. Because that's the strongest structure, apparently, uh, for supporting the, the very heavy Honey that's going to be put in there. Mm. So they seal that honey off and then that'll stay sealed until either some horrible person like myself will come and remove it and steal it from them and put an empty box back on so that they have to do the same again. Yes. Or if bees are just left to their own devices, they'll just store that honey and then they will reuse it when the conditions are not so good. So when there's no more honey coming in and it's starting to get winter time, they need to keep warm, they need to eat honey to keep warm, they will then uncap that honey and oh, eat nice. it and generate heat and feed it to the young bees and so on. So um, that's basically their, their way of survival. It's like storing nuts for squirrels and things. Yes, yes. that's right. Um, but besides honey, bees also gather pollen from, uh, from plants and uh, they need both of them. They can't just survive on either or. Right. Honey is the carbohydrate and pollen is a protein. Right. Pollen is quite often referred to as bee bread. Um, the bees gather it by rummaging around in the flower uh, all the microscopic pollen granules actually stick on the bee's hairs and the bee will rub them off and pack them all together on its back leg there's a hair that sticks out on its back leg at an angle <coughs> yeah. and they pack this pollen around there and they commonly refer to those as pollen baskets and this is what you can see when you're actually watching a beehive entrance and the bees coming to and fro see the great big balls of pollen stuck on the bee's back legs that obviously is the pollen that they've gathered um, during the day. They'll go inside and they'll deposit that into one of the cells as well. So that's that the interesting thing about pollen is it's uh, a very high protein. A lot of sports people use it because it's uh, very beneficial. It's very beneficial for um, attention spans, apparently. Right. A lot of people in the mines use it so that they can stay awake and or stay focused. Um, 
but a pollen granule has a very very hard external outer coating it's almost like a shell and it's actually difficult to digest for the bee so bees pretty clever they've got around this so when they pack it into the um, cell they actually add a bit of honey and a little bit of that enzyme and it ferments the pollen right so that, that fermentation it's not a full fermentation but the partial fermentation process it actually breaks down the outer casing of these pollen granules so it makes it much more palatable and beneficial for the bees when they do eat it so it's nothing to waste absolutely amazing yes so they need both of those things to actually survive um, uh, besides when you were saying what, what a bee is visiting and, and what are they doing with the honey and the pollen they also collect uh, propolis I don't know if you've heard of propolis no nope. propolis is a Greek word which actually translates in English to before the city um, the reason why they call it before the city is because it's a sticky substance that is produced by plants in their nodes and internodes and young buds of plants. It's a very sort of resinous sort of uh, material. The bees will gather that and stick it on their pollen baskets and carry it back to the hive and they actually use it to plug little holes in the hive to keep the ants out and to keep the weather out, you know, if it's oh. raining. And uh, in fact, in some instances, I, I recall when I was young in South Africa, I found a colony of bees underneath a big boulder uh, with two boulders one on each side so basically they were exposed but they'd actually built a propolis shield right down the front of the colony so it was kind of like a it was like a shield it was it was like a piece of bark with a couple of little holes in where the bees would go in and out but they were actually therefore protecting themselves against the rain and the cold wow. so they actually made their own little structure there um, one of the amazing things about propolis is that it's antiseptic Right. Um, and part of the reason why the bees gather it and stick it in the hive is because if you can imagine, bees actually keep the hive at 34 degrees. So it's quite humid and it's quite stuffy in there. So that would promote a lot of mold growth, mildews and so on. So the bees actually coat the inside of the hive with the propolis because it's an antiseptic and it prohibits the growth of those molds. Wow. Which is fantastic. And uh, of course, um, our smart humans have clicked onto this and uh, we actually make a lot of um, tinctures and so on with propolis because apparently it's very very good for your throat mouth ulcers um, just dabbed on there and even just to eat it's apparently very beneficial for your colon mm. as a guard right. against colon cancer so propolis has all these uh, fantastic things too it doesn't taste particularly nice it's quite it's it does taste like chewing a piece of bark right. um, and it's it's almost like a chewing gum type of um, texture and if you chew a piece of raw propolis in your teeth it actually coats your teeth with a sort of slimy feeling but it's very very good in terms of being antiseptic in your mouth and your throat so sore throats and mouth ulcers eat propolis fascinating it is amazing it's just, it's just not one thing it's another and then another yes. and then yeah. another and then yeah. another there's just nothing to waste that's efficient. right yeah Everything they do is it can be can be used to help us. Yes. And then of course, which leads us to the wax. Now beeswax, um, you can eat, you can ingest that. In fact, when you're eating a piece of comb and you have a bite of the comb, it's quite possible to chew it and swallow the beeswax. It's it's it doesn't really have a taste, um, but apparently it's good roughage for you as well. Right. <clears throat> but for eons, humans have been making beeswax candles and beeswax rubs and all sorts of things. They use it to wax thread with, you know, to make, make the thread a bit more waterproof. Yes. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the big fashion houses and the cosmetics giants in Europe demand beeswax from Australia because we're free from pesticides and so yeah. on. And um, it's a very, very high class product. Um, they use it to make cosmetics with, you know, all sorts of facial applications. Mm. Uh, we sell most of our beeswax to a company that makes floor polishes right. and uh, they're just absolutely bent on having Australian only um, beeswax because it is so good. It smells delicious too. Um, the candles burn very cleanly, they're not like a paraffin candle, they're long lasting. Uh, religious circles, um, uh, candles have been made you know, for churches, beeswax candles for eons. Mm. So. Um, there's another thing from the beehive, another product from the beehive, which is absolutely amazing, doesn't, amazingly integrated into, doesn't our, stop. into our system. So if I just change tack slightly, mm -hmm. 
Um, what brought you from South Africa to Australia back in the 80s? Well, <coughs> when we lived in Kenya, my mum's sister and her husband, when we all left Kenya, they left and they went to Tasmania straight mm. away in 1962. And we went to South Africa because my dad had a job there. Um, my mum and dad separated in 1980, I think it was. And, um, and uh, my mum's sister said to my mum, why don't you come and live in Australia? So she was umming and ahhing and then decided, oh, well, I'll give it a go. And it took two years through the immigration process to get there. Um, so we left, it was just because uh, there were four children in our family, my mum and dad. My dad obviously stayed there and my two sisters stayed there. One's now in the UK and the other one's still in, in Africa. But my mum and my brother and myself all came to Tasmania. And um, <clears throat> we... Uh, was that I, tough? Was that tough, splitting up? It was very, very tough. <clears throat> but uh, I think my sisters, being a little bit older than I, than I am, um, had already established their social circles and their friends and so mm. on. And I was recently just out of school. However, I had been working in a bank for a couple of years um, over there. Mm. And I uh, managed to get a banking job in Westpac in, in Tasmania as well. And at that time, um, I didn't really keep bees because it was all a bit of a shock. Emigrating is, is actually quite something. And yes. they say it's one of the most stressful things you can do. It is. Besides <laughs> changing jobs and, and houses and so on. But um, I think integrating into Australian society was fairly easy because it's very similar to what I was used to mm. in South Africa. But um, as I say, I didn't keep bees initially in Tasmania at all. And I was there for a couple of years, but having come from Africa to Tasmania, it was way too cold and tassy for me. So yes. I met some people from Perth and they said, why don't you come over to Perth in WA to see uh, how our weather is and everything. And so I said, yep. And I uh, got a transfer in the bank and here I, here I came. And I, was, uh, I landed here in 84. Mm -hmm. and uh, did a couple of years in the bank and uh, then swapped. Uh, I had a career change and I went into finance in the casino industry because they just started up a casino here. And uh, at that time, I started keeping bees again. Right. And uh, that's when I got back into it. So I've, I've actually I actually run and, and sold honey since the 80s right. here in Perth. That was like a side hustle at that it time. It was, yeah, because I was working full time. Um, however, I used to sell comb honey. I specialise in comb honey. I used to sell it to health food shops and so on, and mm. hotels and whatever. So um, I still had a hand in it. Um, and uh, uh, from there, I, I met my wife, Kim, and uh, we decided, I, I think, you know, if we we're going to be serious about doing this bee thing, we need to do something serious mm. about it. So we decided to go and work on the ships. So we went into the casino industry and the ships out of Hong Kong and Singapore. And we went to Thailand, Malaysia, all of those places, Vietnam. Uh, did that for a while. Um, that was very tiring. Obviously, there's no beekeeping on the ship. No, and, but that was to amass that was the money. To, uh, that was to try and get enough money together to be able to get into what we're doing here. Right. Um, uh, following that, we actually went to go and work in the States in the... Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, which is Guam and Saipan and Tinian, those islands, in the Pacific. And uh, fortunately, I managed to keep bees there. Right. Which was fascinating because uh, I was teaching quite a few locals how to keep bees, and it was a very rewarding time for me. Mm. Great fishing, beautiful reefs, and beekeeping, so couldn't have wanted anything better. It's all that. So we had initially planned to only stay there for a year. We ended up staying for five. Right. So we sort of sort of uh, assimilated into island life fairly easily then, um, and uh, then but we decided still keeping the vision. Still in keeping mind. the vision, yeah. Oh yeah, and uh, I think the eureka moment was when I was sitting on a beach down there, um, and we just had a barbecue, and we thought, no, oh, I think this is the time. I think we need to go now. The Dow Jones has just got to five thousand. <laughs> Where are yeah. we? Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we decided, yeah. no, this is the good time to go. Um, at that time, there was an impending change in ownership of the casino as well. So we thought, well, this is the time. We need to go for it now. So mm. we came back. We had um, been back previously and kept an eye on real estate around, you know, in this area. And this particular location came up, which is on the tourist route. And we, we thought this would be a good place to live, even though we're on a busy road. And mm -hmm. it's not, from a personal point of view, it's, it's not that comfortable. But... 
it's uh, it's certainly uh, on the tourist route. So uh, yeah, we arrived here in, in uh, 2005, halfway through the year when it was bitterly cold, and mm. we thought, oh gosh, it'd be nice to be back <laughs> on that tropical <laughs> island again. But um, and then we started with the whole process of uh, trying to get everything together here. You know, um, yeah. obviously, and was that the for the for the cafe and everything? Did you have that vision way back? Yes, we did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And was that an easy sell to Kim? <laughs> It was, right? Because I, I think she was ready to to uh, to get out of the casino industry too. Because right. I think it's a very finite job. I mean, there are people who stay in that in that profession for their life, their lifetime. But I think the shift work eventually is not so good for you. Yeah, um, makes you very tired, um, upsets your eating habits, and so on. So yeah. yes, she was she was easily, I wouldn't say coerced, but persuaded that yes. you know, this is what we needed to do. And Kim's more of a a creative person than I am, um, as most girls are, and uh, but uh, she, you know, she had her little ideas about what she wanted to do as well. So, uh, with my sort of practical knowledge and her creative knowledge, it worked very well. Yes, and we've always maintained that distinction. So Kim's in there doing all the creative things, and I'm out getting stung with the bees and producing the honey. <laughs> but do the things you enjoy. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so it works really well. It does. It does work very well. So it took quite a while to get that sorted and, and get it up and running because obviously there's a lot of red tape when it comes to um, development applications and so on. And uh, this place used to just be a big paddock, a big grass paddock, a bit boggy in places. And uh, from then we we sort of, we basically did it hands-on the whole way. It took a long time to do it. Um, and um, we, we uh, I can recall doing plasterboarding, helping tiling. There was everything in there. Everything. Building a kitchen, you know, mm. it was it was real hands-on stuff. And at that time, I was working part-time at the casino, and um, it was uh, it was quite difficult because I was working a night shift and then coming to have to work here during right. the day. Yeah. Was it um, exciting and scary? in the fact that you've been working for so many years towards creating this vision and dream and you know a lot of us always have a vision and dream out there but then when it comes to actually making it happen then it's that moment of reckoning of can I actually do this yes well I think I, th I think that as you say it is a, a very big thing in someone's uh, in someone's life to be able to um, actually can uh, commit to such a big change I'd had so long to think about it that I had a plan and I I somehow knew that it wouldn't fail. Yeah. I was that determined. You just knew in yourself. Yeah, I just knew in myself that I'm going to succeed in this. I, I was convinced. I convinced myself. Yeah. Nobody could have convinced me otherwise. Mm. So And you need that, don't you? Yeah, you do. You do need that kind of uh, motivation. And I think um, with that in mind... Uh, when I said we first returned here, I was actually working part time again in the casino mm. during the evening, and Kim kept working there. So when we actually opened the shop, I was the only person in the shop, and I think our our, our most meagre sale was twelve dollars fifty in soft drinks to some road workers who wandered in one day. Yeah. And then I was starting to question myself. I was thinking, hmm, I wonder if people are going to know we're here. But I must say, um, at that time, in my defence, there was a, uh, a lot of road uh, widening going on here on the Great Northern Highway, and uh, it was virtually impossible to actually turn off the road to get into our place. So, right. Um, but, as I say to you, I always had that conviction within me, and I knew that it was going to work. So, oh. you just keep at it. There you go. Um, so... Um, you had that vision of almost you know, bringing people in to share that knowledge of the beast. How does you, you have the shop and the, the cafe? How does how do you actually share the knowledge as well? Well, initially we had a lot of information up there on the wall. We've changed the shop layout somewhat mm. um, since then, but um, you know, with the TV, with the video running, um, and we take pride in educating our staff so they know all about bees so yes. they'll be able to answer basically any question about bees mm. apart from a really technical one perhaps about how to requeen a colony but yes um i you can't give everything away yeah well that's right i mean the thing is the sad thing is as you get busier you find you're not in there as often as you'd like to be in the shop that's correct yes. but 
we still always have somebody in there who's talking to everybody and and running them through everything that goes on with us right. so uh, it's not that difficult to to talk it's not a difficult subject to talk about um, because a lot of people don't know too much about bees and um, you know even even a five minute talk is, mm. is fascinating for most people you know they, they, there are a lot of facts there that you would absolutely have no idea about so the information boards we've got a um, an observation hive in there which is a glass hive so you can actually look into a beehive without being stung right and you can see all the bees doing their thing there so that's also very good for people uh, we've got a few beekeeping tools and uh, natural beehives in there so you can actually see what's used in the profession um, and then of course um, you know we like to we try and immerse people uh, in this experience to make it as as real as possible so we offer free tastings as well of all the honeys and have a description of them and have someone walking around talking about them so mm. that you know it's kind of like a bit of a wine tasting right. scenario where uh, some people may like a lighter honey which is not you know milder flavored and other people prefer a darker really rich molassesy type honey and all of those are produced here so it's it's an easy it's an easy thing because um, there's just so much to talk about. Yes. Yeah. I think that's how we sort of get our message across. Mm. We try to make it and let now. the passion yes. come through. Yes. Which I'm, you know, yes. sitting and experiencing yeah. here. And I do, I do, uh, from time to time, go in there and do talks with with various groups. You know, especially mm. uh, tour operators and so on, so they have an idea of what's going on. We work closely with the um, Swan Valley Tourism uh, Council, so mm. that uh, we we have exposure and people know that we're here yes so um it's quite an easy thing to talk about really yeah yeah so when you're not in the shop what does the average day of a beekeeper look like well we've got to it all depends on the season because there's definitely seasons here um in the winter there's not too much going on with the bees you basically we move them up north and um in the sunnier and a bit slightly warmer on the coastal plain uh, the bees will have first divs at uh, the first wildflowers that come out, so mm. it'll get them going earlier on. Some people even go, some beekeepers even go as far as Calberry, right? Which is a you know a six six to seven hour drive away. But um, and do you work with farmers and? Well, and we do have some private sites where we put the apiaries down upon, but most of the sites that we have are actually leased from the government. Right. It's a, a government body called uh, Biodiversity Parks and Attractions, uh, which was formerly the Department of Parks and Wildlife. And uh, the gazetted sites um, within the um, government land and forests uh, where, where applicable, um, we can keep bees. And so we right. lease those sites from the government, irrespective of whether you've got bees on them or not. We pay a fee every year and because uh, obviously some plants will flower at some time or one year and then yep. the next year they won't so we really have to pick and choose and do a lot of driving around to see what what's going on mm. so in the winter there's not too much to do in the spring is probably our one of the busiest times so because that, yeah. the bees are starting to crank up and uh, in, in increase in numbers we've got to make sure that we give them enough room by swapping all the frames around so we take the frames of honey which are on the outside of the brood nest and lift them up and put empty frames down so that the queen can lay uh, as, as many eggs as possible because uh, congestion is another thing that it adds to swarming you know when the bees take yes. off and take half the bees with them so we don't want that to happen because from a production point of view yeah. you've lost the production on that hive so yeah you, uh, you lost your workers that's right gone. <laughs> they've all gone yeah they've all absconded <laughs> so um, we, we do quite a few spring manipulations so we would leave typically early in the morning um, and drive sometimes four hours or three hours to get to where we're going um, obviously, as it gets warmer during the day, it's more difficult because it's, uh, you know, heat, heat fatigue is actually quite an issue mm. because we're wearing overalls and mm. in some cases gloves and, um, and with the hood on, you know, the bee veil on, it actually makes it pretty hot. So we try and put the bees in shady areas sort of more in the, in the towards summer. Um, but to that end, we've actually moved the bees uh, normally by that time from up the coast down into the forests, you know, surrounding Perth and perhaps south of Perth. And try and locate them in a shady area yes because <clears throat> the bees need to keep cool as well so uh, during the summer there's a lot of honey um, available and perhaps in late spring as well and uh, 
basically a, a beehive is a three-tiered box. Yep. The bottom box is where the queen stays and lays all the eggs. And then there's a screen called the queen excluder, which goes over the top of it, which allows the worker bees to come up, but the queen bee can't come up. Right. So she's confined to that bottom box. The worker bees can push their way through into the next two boxes, which is where they would naturally store their honey. Right. Above the brood nest. Right. <clears throat> so we take advantage of that. We've got these boxes that we put onto the bees. When they fill up a box, we take it off and we slip another one underneath, um, an empty one, and then yeah. they'll continually do that. So it's kind of like a recycling thing. So they move up and then out. Yes, and then, and then off, yes. Right. Yep. So we always make sure that the one that's the most full is on the top, so it's easy to remove at the end. Yes. And uh, when we're removing the honey, we actually put on a um, metal piece well, with, a, with a timber rim, and it's called a clearer board. And what it allows is the bees to move down, but not back up. Right. There's a couple of little vents in the side of it, so at night time, um, bees like to cluster together and to keep warm. So the ones in the top box, in other words, the honey box that you're trying to take off, will think, oh, where's everybody gone? We need to go downstairs. So they'll, they'll migrate downstairs, but they can get down, but they can't come back up because right. of the structure of these little escapes. Ah. So therefore, when we come in the next day or the day after to take the honey off, there's not many bees in the box. Making it we don't, easy. yeah, because makes it makes it a little easier. Because we don't want to bring those bees home because a they'll cause a nuisance and sting everybody, and b yeah. you lose that worker force, you know, from your yes. from your hive. So we've actually, <clears throat> excuse me, we use a, a blower, which will blow the bees out of the box, and basically they just take flight and then land back in the hive again. Right. So we upend the box, and the the spaces between all the frames, which are the wooden boarded structures where the bees actually build a comb in. Uh, there's little spaces there and we just blow through those spaces and it'll blow the bees out right and allow them to return to the hive and us to take the box with not many bees in it you see or virtually no bees in it yes yeah so um that's what happens during the summer there's a lot of moving of bees around because obviously one plant species will finish and another will begin mm -hmm. and we need to keep an eye we need to be basically six months ahead keeping an eye on what's going to fly out next so yes we're always out there in the field driving around having a look to see what's what's next on the agenda because we need to keep the bees working on something to be able to maintain their numbers yes so as soon as you take the bees away from a nectar source or a pollen source the queen uh, realizes that there's nothing coming in the front door anymore and she'll start to taper down on her egg lane right so therefore your, your colony population will decrease so the idea is to keep as many bees in the hive as possible so keep we've busy. got to look after them it's like taking a a cow to a new paddock all the time. Yes. Yeah. Make sure there's enough grass for it. Awesome. It's just, I love the efficiency of it. That's amazing. It is. It's fascinating. Um, we read a lot in media, internet, etc., etc., about the health of bees. Um, I suppose on a global level, you, you know, you're frequently seeing, you know, such and such a multinational company is creating a seed that that's not going to help the bees etc um is that true what can you comment on the the health of the, the, yes, the bee population yeah. both in western australia and globally well in australia generally we are very very fortunate because mm. um we don't have a mite called the varroa mite the right. varroa mite has basically made it all around the world started off on the korean peninsula way back in the 80s it was endemic to a species of bee there uh, the Asian honeybee, and um, apparently it was spread uh, with beekeepers bringing their bees in through the Siberian Railway, would you believe, um, to beekeeping or beekeeping pastures in that neck of the woods and then returning back to Europe. And right. that facilitated the jump of this mite from the one species of bee to the other. So they suddenly started latching on to the European honeybee, and then of course it just went like wildfire around the world. This little mite actually punctures the exoskeleton of the bee and it also uh, right. climbs into the brood of the bee and it kills the young bees as they're, as they're developing. Wow. It's a horrible little thing. Mm. Uh, it can be transmitted from one bee to the other, even on flowers. If one bee's next to another bee which has a mite, it can jump over and they're really quite destructive. And it, it's actually called Varroa destructor is its name. Right. There are a couple of different Varroa, but there's one, the Varroa destructor is the most destructive one. Um, from an Australian perspective, we have a very active uh, aquas program where actually um, uh, try and stay on top of 
incursions of bees into Australia. And what I mean by that is sometimes a colony of bee will, bees will come in on the, perhaps in the underneath a container or in a bit of machinery into a port and they've come from uh, some Asian country, you know, perhaps China or uh, Malaysia or Indonesia, wherever it may be, and uh, those bees might carry that mite. So right. what, what we don't want to happen is for those mites to be able to um, remain on those bees when those bees are in Australia, and then, of course, those bees will knock into our bees on the flowers, yeah. and then next minute we're the same as the rest of the world. Yeah. So we have a very active surveillance program, which um, we have hives all around different ports and airports and so on, Mm. so that we can have perhaps an early warning system right to so they would gravitate towards these that's right eyes and then they're checked off yeah um within west australia we have less bee diseases than over east in any of the eastern states or or even in um, the northern territory so we have a very strict quarantine i don't know if you've ever encountered trying to bring honey into west australia you just cannot do it Mm. the reason is there are bee diseases um, and bacterial infections which actually form spores in the honey, harmless to you and I to eat, but if somebody bought a jar of honey in which was full of these spores, fair enough, eat it in your kitchen and then throw it in the rubbish tip, but there's still a couple of drops of honey in it. If it ends up open in the rubbish tip and a bee gets in there and starts to suck up this honey, because bees will naturally steal the honey, honey back like if it's said, available... Yeah. Um, then we end up with that disease. So right. that's why there's such a rigorous um, effort to keep honey out of West Australia, unless it's been pasteurised. Right. When it's been heat, heat treated or irradiated, then it's okay. But anything else, we can't have in here. Hmm. Um, so once again, we're in a very, for, a very, very fortunate position here um, compared to the rest of the world. Um, uh, we also. Uh, a lot of the beekeepers stay away from genetically modified crops, uh, monoculture. You know, yeah. uh, the uh, canola, which is called rape in in the in Europe, mm. um, because a lot of the seeds are uh, coated with neonicotinoids, right. which are very nasty poison seed coating, which actually is uh, is a systemic um, pesticide. What happens is when the plant grows, the plant is carrying that that um, those nasties around within yep. the plant itself ends up in the pollen. The bees, bees collect the pollen and the nectar and they take it back to the hive. Now, yep. a lot of the big companies have argued that, oh, this isn't enough to kill a bee. Fair enough, it's not enough to kill a bee in one instance. But the cumulative effect and, yes. and the packing of the bees of this honey and the pollen into their combs all of a sudden reaches a lethal dose and then the whole hive just disappears. And I don't know if you've ever heard of colony collapse disorder. Which no. is CCD, which is a which is something they've been finding in America, particularly and in Europe, and there've been big uh, court cases on uh, trying to prohibit these big companies like Bayer and Monsanto from yeah. from uh, planting or distributing those seeds within these areas because it's been proven that the uh, pesticide will eventually knock off a, a colony of bees. Yeah. So there's the. I think they've had a win in the in in Europe in the mm. EU, uh, where they are not allowed to use certain certain uh, seeds, certain seed coatings, therefore trying to protect the beekeeping uh, side of things. Um, Just um, playing that through, um, obviously, if there was a, re- a significant reduction in the bee population from that, I mean. Granted, it would affect industries like yourself, but what impact would it have on you know, like the order of nature? Pretty devastating. Um, what they found, uh, even in China, there are so few bees, they're actually having to manually pollinate trees. There are people right. on ladders with paintbrushes trying to pollinate trees. Right. Because in Australia at the moment, there are quite a few feral bees out there um, in trees, hollows, and so on. And that's only possible because we don't have these diseases. If these diseases came here, um, particularly the Roa mite, all of those colonies will disappear because unless you manage them, yep. they're going to die off. So bang goes the free pollination. So farmers can no longer rely on feral bees pollinating their crops. They would have to pay for bees to come in, manage bees, and they'll be in such demand because it would be that much more difficult to keep a bee colony alive because mm. of these nasties 
that it impacts everything. It impacts it impacts food production. It impacts all sorts of things. The whole economics of farming are changed yes. because of that. And you, a lot of people don't realize just how many feral bees there are out there actually doing doing their thing and and doing everybody a favor. Mm. Without them, we'd be in dire straits, definitely. Right. Mm. It's interesting to hear because I'm sort of in the media. You you hear these links, but I didn't quite add it all up. Yes, it does. It does have a huge impact. I mean, if if honeybees disappeared, they say two thirds of the world uh, food supply would disappear, mm. which is quite frightening. Yes. Because I mean, we're trying. It's hard enough to feed the population as it is. If you suddenly had a a decline in food production of those sort of proportions of those sort of percentages it would be quite devastating for mm. a lot of a lot of human beings mm. yeah what's the health of the uh, west australian honey industry very good at the moment yeah obviously it fluctuates with uh, conditions you know if we have droughts it's it's, it's not so good yeah um, we're fairly lucky because we can move our bees around depending on what's flowering um but West Australia is going ahead in leaps and bounds because we've got a lot of trees uh, that are now producing, uh, I say now producing, but have been found to produce anti antimicrobial honey. Mm-hmm. Um, and by that I mean honey that is antiseptic. So uh, they use this particular type of honey uh, for, in particular for wound dressings, burn victims and burns victims and so on. Uh, it's particularly effective in... Um, combating uh, Staphylococcus aureus, which is golden staph. So um, they've done a lot of studies on this, and uh, basically these honeys, and I'm talking about red gum, jarrah, jarrah in particular is a very, very sought after honey here in WA, mm. only flowers every, uh, only flowers biennially every two years. Um, but then there's also red gum, there's black butt, there's a honey down from the south coast called Yate, um, and even carry honey mm. from down south um, all have shown to have these antimicrobial activities in them because mm. was a big flowering so, of the carry was it a couple of years ago there was yes yeah that was fantastic um, so from that point of view we are quite fortunate because a lot of our honeys that we produce have these benefits there's also natural leptospermum which is manuka um, occurring in some areas in WA I mean obviously it's not a not a flower that you could access all the time and it doesn't flower all the time but we are producing mm. manuka type honeys in in west australia as well so uh, worldwide there's been an awakening you could say of um, of the populations realizing just how beneficial honey is for treating all these things yes. rather than using antibiotics so um you know there's a this kind of like, and because of because of West Australia's isolation and um, you know pristine conditions, makes it particularly attractive for uh, overseas buyers in particular to to buy our honey. So we're very fortunate. Mm. The industry is enjoying a lot of growth at the moment because of that fact, and of course a lot of people are sort of cottoning on to the fact that manuka isn't the only honey that has these microbial activities. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, obviously, it's a finite resource, but um, there are a lot more trees and um, beekeepers in WA than there used to be. So, um, we we do have problems, obviously, facing us. Uh, logging is one of them in the mm. forests. Um, the other thing is um, because of uh, climate change and the way things are working with wildfires these days, um, parks and wildlife are actually burning, uh, doing more prescribed burns to protect properties. Um, in my opinion, they're probably burning too much because a lot of our um, a lot of our country, and particularly on the coastal heathland, takes up to five years to recover, mm. um, and they have a mandate to do a lot of burning at the moment. Um, and sometimes uh, I would say, I would suggest, I don't know this for a fact, but they are burning in marginal conditions where perhaps it's not beneficial to burn the bush at that time, and yeah. you'd end up with more harm than good. I mean, obviously. You've got rid of the fire risk, but you've also got rid of all the biodiversity, all the all the yeah. animals that are that are you know, inhabiting that particular so good piece for of land. Good for humans, not good for the bush. Mm. Um, I've I've always maintained that perhaps they should be burning in strips rather than huge zones, open zones, because um, 
that way you're still protecting human interests, you're still protecting human lives and properties, but you're not absolutely decimating the bush. Yes. And I think it's all a question of economics. I don't know whether they have the resources to be able to do that, mm. which is sad. It is. Mm. It is, especially when you listen mm. to it from this perspective. Yeah. Because if you, if you think about it, if you're burning the bush in spring, there are so many birds and species uh, yeah. multiplying and, and you know, nesting and so on, they lost. Yeah. They lost. And if they burn one patch of the bush on one side of the track one year and then the next patch uh, on the other side of the track the year after, where's everything gone? Yeah. Yeah. Up in smoke. Yeah. That's right. Not to mention the, uh, the CO2. Mm. Mm. So if someone's listening to this and they're thinking to themselves, you know, I'd really like to keep some bees in the garden or somewhere, how could they go about it? Well, in West Australia, um, and I would suggest perhaps in most places in Australia and in fact the world, there are a lot of small associations of beekeepers. Mm. Um, each area, I know in the UK there are a lot of associations, depending on where you're living. Mm. Um, in West Australia, we have uh, an organisation called the West Australian Beekeepers, um, um, WAAS, West Australian Apris Society. Um, there's another one called um, West Australian Beekeepers, WABA, um, and WA Farmers. Now, what happens is, I think in most suburbs in, in uh, Perth and surrounding areas, you can actually have two hives in your back garden. You're allowed two hives of bees. Right. You have to check with your local shire to make sure whether it's permissible. Right. Um, there are a couple of beekeeping shops around where you can actually buy all the woodware mm -hmm. and in fact you can even buy a starter hive so a starter hive is called a nucleus hive which is only three or four of those frames of bees mm -hmm. okay live bees with a queen and everything and basically you'll transfer that into your full-size hive and watch it grow and then basically put the boxes on the top and hopefully gather all the honey that's available in your area yeah a lot of the hives in the suburbs uh, are particularly well looked after because there's so many flowers in people's gardens and around so it'll basically keep them going all year round yeah more so than a commercial beekeeping enterprise where we actually have to move the bees around to right everywhere else everywhere that's flowering so um you could have two three four times a year where you're actually producing honey from your hive in the garden right obviously you need some protection equipment you need the gloves the uh, the veil um, and the overalls to stop uh, to minimize stinging yeah um, and also uh, you also <clears> would have to make sure that you purchase a colony of bees or a nucleus of bees which is from a reputable queen breeder mm -hmm. and by that I mean a beekeeper who's breeding queens which are noted for their quietness and productivity and and lack of aggression so because right. as I said to you before there are bees that are more aggressive or more defensive than others yeah. and it's essential I think when you're first starting to actually um, get yourself a colony of bees which is easy to handle yes and not going to frighten you off in the first week yes um you can you can actually cut the comb honey out and have it as that or squash it or or um, you can even hire a little extractor honey extractor or honey spinner some people call them yeah which uh you can put your frames in with them around it'll spin all the honey out and then you put the empties back on the bees and off they go again and do the same again and they're quite a quite a lot of hobby beekeepers uh, in 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 our immediate area now i think there's mm. up to 1500 of them wow. uh, just just within the perth metropolitan region but it is quite easy there's a lot of support out there this amateur society um, have talks every every month and i would suggest perhaps a lot of beekeeping associations do the same um, where you can you can rub shoulders with fellow beekeepers, compare notes, and uh, you know talk about this fascinating subject. So there's mm. a lot of support out there. Yeah, mm. superb. Do you get stung much? I do. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you deal with it? Well, I've been known to what swear you, a bit well, sometimes. Yeah, I but, can imagine. <laughs> what do you put on a bee sting? <laughs> I don't put anything. No. I just the best thing to apply for me is is um, amnesia. amnesia. Forget about forget, forget that it's even happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look, I get stung all the time. I get stung just about every time I go to the bees. Um, there are some times when, you know, you do have to wear gloves. I, I, I sometimes, or I'm, I would say 60% of the time I don't wear gloves, but when you, depending on what you're doing in your apiaries and what sort of inhabitants you have, 
as I said to you before, some beehives are more aggressive than others. So yeah. um, I, I do get stung and I get stung through the overalls, would you believe? You know, and right. especially the bees know when you're bending over and the overalls are tight, they go for the prime target area <laughs> of your, your backside and uh, next minute it comes through. Yeah. Um, the thing is, if you're getting stung through overalls or through clothing, uh, at least the clothing will pull away and then the sting won't be stuck in you. Because yes. The, um, what you don't want is the sting to remain in you because what happens is the bee will pull away and it leaves a little poison sac on the top of the sting, which has got its own little muscle, by the way, which is pumping the poison. Oh, into, so it's still doing yeah, it. It's still doing it. So a lot of people go, oh, ouch, I've been stung by a bee and try and pull the sting out. Worst thing you can do, you need to scrape it out. Scrape it out. Because if you pull it out, you're squeezing the poison sac and you're pushing all the poison into your wound. Right. If you're you basically injecting it, out, it before yes, you... that's right. right. That's right. It's like a, like a pipette, you know? Yes. So if you scrape it out with your fingernail or a knife or something yes, else across handy, the top. Ac or across the base of the sting, so in other mm. words, follow your skin along yeah. and just push the skin, I mean, push the sting out from the side, it's not going to do anything to that little sack of poison on the top right. and you're going to minimize the reaction. Mm. Obviously, the people who can become anaphylactic, you know, you can go into anaphylactic shock. The people who need EpiPens, yeah. it all depends on your personal makeup. There's some people who, uh, fortunately, like I am, I get stung, I have a very, very small swelling, yes. and I carry on. But there are other people who have difficulty breathing, that have to be rushed to hospital straight away, have to be on, um, on, on drips and all sorts of stuff, and wow. uh, antihistamine to actually combat the allergic reaction because mm. it can cause a shutdown of the system. And I think from memory, 1,200 bee stings was, will be enough to kill a human being. Wow. So we try and avoid that, obviously. Yes. And there are things that we do that, um, that uh, you know, within the apiary that do not annoy bees. Uh, you've got to know what to, how to move, not to bang things around, not to wear dark clothing, all those sort of things because the bees seem to go for dark clothing too. Right. Yeah, so that's there are things you can do. Rules, yes, that's right. And also from the cooling point of view, yes. obviously you get too hot and something dark. But um, one of the one of the ways we do combat the stinging thing is obviously with the breeding of the queens and the and the genetics of the queen. So we try and have gentle stock so that whenever I come across a hive that's particularly aggressive, I actually have to knock that queen off and requeen it with a queen that's yes, better. Yeah. More dormant. And then obviously you have to wait for some time for those bees. Uh, to hatch the new ones and the old ones to die off and then all of a sudden it'll change its temperament and it'll be quite decent to work with yeah mm. Mm. so this has been a fascinating journey listening to what have um what have been some of the the key personal learning points for you going you know working with the bees setting up the business you know the whole story of lesson to um personal learning i think I think a big one is to trust in yourself, definitely from a, a business point of view. Mm. And um, if you're doing something that you really like, then the chances are you're going to succeed at it. If you're doing something just for money or if you're doing something just because somebody else said it's a good idea, it's not really the thing for you. Mm. I've, I've had a love for bees ever since I was very young. So to me, um, even though uh, some of the aspects of the things that I do especially manual labor, because it's a very, very demanding uh, situation out there because you're moving tons mm. of honey around um, manually. Mm. Um, if you're not physically equipped, it's not such a good thing. Um, but I think if you love what you're doing, to me, it doesn't seem like a job and, and you enjoy it. Yeah. So for me, that was one of the most profound things of changing from my financial background into the beekeeping was... I was doing something I was loving, so it really didn't feel like I was working another day in my life because mm. I was just enjoying what I was doing. Whether I was just making boxes or driving out in the bush and looking at the trees or... It's a part of the bigger thing. Yeah, or doing it tough, you know, and uh, taking the honey off at 20 to 30 kilos a box and doing that a couple of hundred times a day is actually quite tough and you're mm. exhausted by the end of it. But it's still rewarding, you know, because you think, well, I'm working with nature here and um, it's... Uh, it's 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 just a great thing. You mm. feel like you're not you're not harming the earth at all. You mm. you're, you're working with it and and you're making it. You're earning a living from it and you're enjoying what you're doing at the same time. So, what could be better? Indeed. Mm -hmm. What does the next uh, three to five years look like for Rufus? 
Oh, pretty much the same. Um, I want to try and I want to try and somehow um, build something where people can actually watch the honey extracting going on, right? And perhaps an auditorium where we could uh, do more speeches and 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 lessons, <coughs> perhaps. Mm -hmm. Uh, teaching uh, teaching beekeeping has been a good thing, I think, because it's all in in my old uh, Noga. I, I don't really have to think too much about <laughs> yeah, it, which is great. So, talk. so, <laughs> so um, I think we've always I've always wanted to do a little bit of uh, teaching of, of uh, you know beekeeping and so on. So I think if we built a facility, we have a place here where we could get onto it. But once again, it's always a question of funding. But um, I think if we could grow in that direction, it would be very, very mm. beneficial. Give people even more of an experience with the whole beekeeping thing. Yeah. Um, but there's been quite a lot of work done by the local government um, with uh, wildflowers, would you believe? Um, having people doing wildflower tours, and now they're talking about beekeeping tours. So people can go out and see wow. the forests where the honey is, mm. is uh, gathered and perhaps drive past an apiary and go to a honey shop or whatever. So I think it's all good, you know, yeah. because um, it's all it's all food for thought and it's and it's all motivational for, for people and for the tourism industry. So mm. And with that, like you said earlier on, with that increase in numbers of was it fifteen hundred, you know, um, yep. amateur apiarists. Yeah. Um, it's obviously there's something there around the bay. Yes. You know, it's a very addictive thing. And yeah. a lot of people who start beekeeping keep beekeeping because, you know, it's fascinating. I mean, yeah. obviously, a few would start and then get a few stings and think this is not for me. But yes, uh, I think it's a very addictive thing. You know, once you start keeping bees, you sort of think, well, why wasn't I doing this ten years ago or fifty years mm. ago? You know? Yeah. Mm. If you could go back, um, if you could go back to when you started your beekeeping journey and give you give that younger self a bit of advice, what would that be? Um, what would that be? I think I, I wouldn't be able to give myself any advice, right. to be quite honest. I, I, I think I've just done it in absolutely the right measures at the right time. I, I, uh, I could only do as much as I could at the time, um, beekeeping in South Africa, because obviously I was still at school and, mm. and, uh, and so on. Um, but I don't think I could. I don't. I don't have anything to add to my fascinating journey because it's it's been really, really fantastic, and I, I find that I can. Um, I look back and I don't think I would change anything. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, a final question I normally had ask is um, if you could um, pass one little nugget of information and have it sort of uploaded into the collective consciousness, much like bees have um, for humans, what would that be? Okay, I probably have to make it a couple of sentences, but here goes. I think what I would say is we all need to learn to be more tolerant and understanding and kind to each other because I think that is what is the very fabric of keeping a beehive together. Right. They collectively work for common good, and I think humans are starting to lose that. So I think we can learn a lot from the bees. Mm. If we could follow what they do in terms of working together, helping each other, the world would be a better place, definitely. Thank you very, very much. Um, if somebody wants to come and find you, where, how can they? Well, we're just in, this, uh, in the great growing region surrounding Perth called the Swan Valley, and we're on a, a major road called the Great Northern Highway. Uh, only about five kilometres out of Midland. Um, we're fairly well signposted, so we have a shop there and um, yep. you come and enjoy a tea or coffee and um, learn all about the bees and taste the honey. Indeed. And you've got a website? I have well? a website, I have Facebook and uh, also on Instagram. So. And you're also talking to the Masterclass at Entwined later this week? That's correct, I am. Uh, we, we've uh, taken that opportunity, uh, which, is, which is in line with the theme of the whole Entwined in the Valley, and that is to uh, show case what the Swan Valley is all about, the producers are having a few long table lunches, um, uh, meet the makers basically, yep. um, there are a few uh, specialised courses with the wines and of course what we're doing is uh, I'm going to be uh, delivering a talk for up to about 30 people 
on the Sunday the 7th um, about beekeeping and perhaps getting involved in beekeeping and what to do. Awesome. Rupert, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. It's been a pleasure talking to you too. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. <laughs>